Henry Butler, welcome to Australian Musician. Well, it's, it's good to be here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I believe the, uh, the show last night was, uh, was pretty cool. Yes. Uh, the audience was very receptive and, and uh, responsive, and I think we had a lot of fun with them too. Yeah. I wanted to go right back to uh, when you were growing up at home. Um, when did you first begin to take notice of piano players and different piano styles? Probably when I was, well, I, I, I mean, I first remembered I first remember listening to pianists when I was like four. I would I would pass by different houses and hear people practicing. I I thought not a whole lot of it, but uh, I. But the more I listened to them, and the more I passed by these houses and bars and. And then go to these churches, and the more I decided that I liked it, mm. that I was at least interested in listening. <clears throat> and then, um, when I was a student at this boarding school in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in the in the states. I got summoned out of class by the elementary uh, school music teacher, and uh, she said to me, uh, we're volunteering you to take piano lessons. Okay. And she asked me if I knew the, me the meaning of the word volunteer, and uh, in essence, I just well, I think I knew the meaning in that sense, yeah. um, but um, I decided, you know, let's let's give it a go for a minute, and then I al almost instantly decided that I didn't want to be volunteered. <laughs> so I would I started losing my music books and my music primers. Uh, but somebody would always find them. And then by the time I got to fifth grade, uh, I decided I really liked doing this stuff. I liked playing piano and I liked learning the music and I liked trying to learn stuff by ear. I was also um, learning uh, using the Braille Music Code, um, but um, it was also it was a lot of fun learning by ear the some of the melodies of you know the R and B songs, pop songs of that day. Yeah. So when you were fourteen and, and still at school, I believe you started playing professionally. What, what yeah. sort of what sort of clubs were you playing? Um, they were mostly bars and um, occasionally we would play uh, high school dances and um, and other other places that were just more or less dance kinds of things uh, clubs that were. Uh, wanting to hire bands for for their dance party, that kind of thing. So we, we did that um, at 16. I, jo I joined another band and we really started getting pretty serious professional gigs. Yeah. And we were the on-call band for a lot of people coming to town. A lot of blues artists coming to town, like um, well, people that you might not have heard of over here. Um, Syl Johnson, um, Garland Green, Al Green. Actually, we, 
We used to play with Al Green before he became famous. Yeah. And um, uh, we actually, we wound up playing or opening for the Four Tops and people like that. And, you know, I was having fun, 16 yeah, sure. years old, making money. Yeah. yeah. So who's been the most important piano influence on you? In the very early years, there was a student at the School for the Blind that was phenomenal. I mean, he was a phenomenal class classical player. He was a phenomenal jazz player. And he played R&B. Um, his name was Robert Eugene Powell. We used to call him Bobby Powell. And um, he had a few regional uh, hit records. Um, and aside from that, nationally, um, when I was 16, 16, 17, well, by that time I'd started listening to Oscar Peterson. Um, I couldn't play a lot of the stuff he was playing, but uh, it, was nice, it was nice listening to him. Um, and we started listening to uh, Professor Long here, and a lot of the local guys. Um, it was easy and and desirable to listen to those guys. Yeah. Why do you think it is that uh, New Orleans has produced so many great piano players? A lot of poor cities produce great musicians and and great artists, not just musicians. Yeah. It's their way out of poverty. And um, so, yeah, I think for me, as I observed that, that was the biggest reason why there was so many good musicians from there. Yeah. Did you prefer the sound of a grand piano or an upright, as far as acoustic pianos go? Well, I like the sound of a grand better, but when, as a youngster, <clears throat> as a youngster, we were playing more uprights, and when, when on the better gigs, we would play grands. Yeah. And I see tonight you're playing a, a digital piano. Yeah. Uh, there is a, a grand on stage. Um, why do you prefer the digital for your, your stage? Show? Well, it's an electric band. I mean, electric bass player, electric guitar, and and drums. So I find that it's hard to compete with those kinds of instruments using a grand piano. Yeah. I mean, you can, but um, playing this kind of music, playing R&B music and um, sort of southern rock, that kind of thing. Um, I need to have an electric piano. Yeah. Uh, playing a residency like this, we're playing multiple shows in one place. Uh, how do you go about selecting the material to play? Well, we select the material you know, quite a while, well, long before we get to a place like this. And um, we, we have pretty much uh, two or three sets that we play over a four or five day period. And we kind of move things around and we sort of add things and change the way we play things. 
so that it's not really sounding the same all the time. Uh, tell me about the Jambalaya band. Uh, where did you hook up with these guys? Well, we're all living in New York. and um, But if you heard us, you would think they were from New Orleans. Um, we have um, Fred Cash on bass. And Fred is one of the offsprings of one of the people who sung in the Impressions uh, in the 50s, early 60s. Okay. Um, on guitar, we have uh, Bobby Bryan, um, and he's been playing for a while. Um, uh, I also write with him, and we write a lot of stuff together. Um, and on drums, there's Adrian Harpham. Adrian um, is producing some stuff in the business. He's, um, he's a wonderful drummer. And um, I think we'll see about his production yeah. skills, you know, at some point. But uh, that's it. That's yeah. the group. Yeah. Uh, we recently lost uh, Fats Domino and we've lost Alan Toussaint and yeah. so long hair. Um, did you hear many younger players coming through that might prolong the legacy? You know, I'm hearing a lot of youngsters. Some of them are pretty good. But I wouldn't say that any of them would replace the kind of people that we're losing. I mean, they're different personalities. You know, they're just different. And the whole, the whole style, the whole, the whole musical culture is different now. So, um, with, you know, losing Charles Neville, um, Alan, Fats Domino, um, they had their own personality. And uh, I, I think a lot of the older people like me, you know, we're going to miss those guys. Yeah. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to still like many of the new guys that are coming up and that are putting out new stuff. Um, but I think many, I mean, we'll never have another Fats Domino or another um, Alan Toussaint. We, we just won't. Yeah. yeah. What's the most beautiful piano piece you've ever heard? Oh, man. I'm not sure. I, I, uh, I think um, I listen to a lot of stuff, a lot of music. I listen to uh, uh, lots of musical genres. Um, and there's, there's beautiful stuff in almost every genre. Um, you know, give me some sati, give me some um, you know, um, gosh, give me some art tatum. Um, and beauty is beauty is relative, you know, it's it's uh, some people like and see technique as being beautiful. Um, some people seeing, some people see uh, melodic writing, uh, lyricism, all of that um, as being beautiful. And I, I think I, I agree with all of that. I think 
I, man, there's just so much beautiful stuff out there. It's hard for me to have a favorite piece. Yeah. Uh, I'm interested in your photography um, as a blind person. Yes. What are you feeling out for before you click the, the camera button? Well, first of all, I got into it because I wanted to see why the sighted world was so interested in looking at images on a piece of paper or a piece of canvas, you know, or um, just what interested them um, in, in images. So um, I think before I take a picture, I'm interested in the person. I'm interested in how they're going to respond to what I'm doing. Because I know f for most of these people, it's very different for them to have a blind person take a picture of them. Yeah. Um, I don't have to worry about that when I'm taking a picture of some architectural structure. Uh, because it just sits there waiting for me. You know, it's beautiful. Yeah. Um, and mainly now, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in seeing what, what kind of response I'm going to get from sighted people. Yeah. I know that when you show sighted people or anybody um, an image, you, you show three people an image, you're going to get three interpretations of what's being seen and, and what's there. And all of that has to do with the intellect, you know, the person's intellect and uh, how each person's intellect varies from, you know, the other person. Do you have uh, many bucket list projects, things that you want to get to that maybe we wouldn't expect of you? Oh, I don't know what you expect of me. <laughs> you know, that's, that's one of the things. But um, I never worry about what people expect. Mm. Uh, I, I go into something, I go into doing something because I want to do it. Yeah. And, and that's it. Um, so when I write a piece, it's not based on what somebody thinks I ought to be doing. Or when I take a picture, it's not based on what they think should happen. Right, Henry Butler, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. And, uh, oh, it's been my pleasure, man. We look forward to seeing the show tonight. Well, thank you. Okay, cool. All right.